Hello everyone, I am Dr. Sajid Parit. I am a senior researcher with the Land and Mark Water Management Department at IIT Delft Institute for Water Education. We are an education institute located in Delft, the Netherlands. In this short video, I am going to give you a brief on the role of remote sensing in estimating water productivity at different scales. The advantage of using open access satellite data in combination with remote sensing techniques to estimate water productivity components and water productivity at different scales. Now let's see what remote sensing can offer in estimating the water productivity at different scales and what more information or what added value remote sensing brings in this kind of analysis. The major advantage of using remote sensing based techniques in water productivity assessments is the opportunity or the possibility to map water productivity at different scales. Why? Because the main source of data used in remote sensing based applications, in this case water productivity assessment, are coming from earth observing satellites. So these earth observing satellites are continuously monitoring our Earth's surface, both land and water, from the space and it cover the entire globe, which means these satellites offer periodic data depending on each satellite type covering the entire globe. This is a very big opportunity in establishing monitoring systems. It enables monitoring at high spatial and temporal scale. Of course, the spatial and temporal property of the assessments or the temporal scale at which we can assess, for example, water productivity depends on the kind of satellites we use for analysis. It can be the Sentinels, it can be Landsat, or it can be much coarser resolution based MODIS data sets as well. So the advantage is that these data in combination with remote sensing techniques can be used to monitor from national scale to basin scale or at field level, depending on the application, depending on the questions we are asking or we are seeking to answers to. Remote sensing and the satellite missions are a growing field and there are many more newer and future missions planned by the public agencies which offer more opportunity in the coming years. Another important advantage of the point is the open data policies adopted by the public space agencies which means that all the satellites, the, all the data acquired from the satellites missions by these public agencies will be offered free of cost, which is a huge opportunity for scientists like us to implement these kind of workflows to monitor our productivity. In, in the recent years, there are newer algorithms to estimate biophysical variables more accurately, which makes the analysis more reliable. Now let's see different water productivity components from satellite data. As you all know, water productivity has two major components. In the numerator, it's biomass, above ground biomass production, which can be converted to new crop yield if you know the crop information and crop parameters. And in the denominator, it is the consumptive water use often represented by actual evapotranspiration, especially when we estimate that from remote sensing. So the key point here is that remote sensing can be used to estimate both biomass and consumptive water use, which are spatially explicit, which means it gives us spatial variation over an area, over your study area, and which is also temporarily frequent, which means you can monitor periodically. 
it enables monitoring of water productivity periodically for example every season uh, over a steady area so in this case this map shows both biomass in kilogram per hectare and actually water transpiration in millimeter per year so it's a total biomass in a year both are estimated from satellite data biomass from optical satellite data and evapotranspiration from thermal satellite data using the bar algorithm so that leads to one of the most demanding studies nowadays on how to establish remote sensing based water productivity monitoring which which includes three major um, steps. One is the crop type mapping of your study area. For example, if you want to assess water productivity over a irrigation scheme uh, over a season, then you can do that by adopting adopting three major steps. Step one, crop type mapping. Step two, water use or biomass estimation. And step three, uh, by computing crop water productivity uh, from these two components. Each is followed by a assessment step, which includes various spatial analysis steps using the crop type map to extract crop-based water productivity. So the major points are we, we can establish this monitoring system using the open satellite data sets. So it's low cost, um, more applications possible all over the world. We have open source libraries like the library in, developed by IHE Delft called PySabal, which is available in this particular URL. So it can be used to monitor or assess land or water use and productivity near real time. It can be, this method can be extended to any geographical region at multiple scales. So that is the main advantage of using remote sensing based water productivity model. This slide shows a visual representation of different spatial scales, for example, at continental scale, this is the data obtained from Vapor data set, FAO Vapor data set. Actually, Vapor transpiration, you can see it's 250 meter. You can get for the entire continent, a snapshot of the entire continent. It can be seasonal, it can be monthly, or it can be an annual map as well, depending on uh, the temporal scale at which you're working on. Further, you can zoom into a country, for example, Iran, you can see in Iran, if you, if you zoom in, you can further get insights about the spatial variation of active water transpiration in Iran. Maybe you, if you are interested more in studying about a basin, in this case, Urmia Lake Basin, you will get, um, you can, you will get more insights about spatial variation of actual water transpiration. As expected, you can see irrigation schemes and water bodies having higher actual water transpiration and other areas having lower. And further, you can zoom into a scheme which is in this area of the basin, and you can also go further deep into feed level. Now, the major point here is that at larger scale, at continental and national scale, uh, we may have to use coarser resolution data sets like MODIS data set. And as we move from basin to field, we can use higher resolution data sets like Landsat or Sentinel for our analysis. In this slide, I want to introduce an open access database uh, developed by a food and agriculture organization. It's called FAO WAPR database, a publicly accessible near real time database using satellite data. Data on evapotranspiration, biomass production, um, and what productivity are available uh, for the period 2009 to present. It's available at different uh, temporal uh, frequencies like decadal, every 10 days, monthly, seasonal, annual. Um, it can be used to monitor agricultural water productivity. The spatial coverage is Africa and Near East up to Iran. And it is available at three different levels, 
level one which covers the entire region level two and three covers selected countries and selected application schemes this is the url uh, to access whopper and whopper data sets and here at IHE, we have also uh, implemented an open course where on how to analyze what productivity and implement what accounting model using Whopper dataset. You can use this URL to access this course and it's open. An example of showing different components of remote sensing based monitoring of our productivity. This example is coming from Miando irrigation scheme in Iran. You can see the first step is to uh, develop a, a good crop type map. Uh, here you can see the crop type map uh, representing the Miando irrigation scheme, representing a season. Um, the major crops are alfalfa, wheat and barley. Uh, there are many orchards here. And um, implementing models like Sabal or Paisabal come up with actually vapor transpiration and a UE based model to come up with biomass um, it's actually above ground biomass production in kilogram per hectare and finally compute water productivity using um, a simple equation of biomass upon actually vapor transpiration um, for the spatial analysis if you have field boundaries you can use um, those two images or the water productivity image to extract water productivity values per field. In this case, as we know the crop type map as well, as we also have the crop type map, we can uh, go up to a level where we can uh, compute field wise yield water productivity uh, of alfalfa and wheat and barley in this case. And on the left side, you can see it's biomass productivity for alfalfa and wheat and barley. You can already see the difference between biomass and yield based water productivity and how much the crop water productivity varies um, within a distributary uh, canal system. So it gives insights into water productivity variation across uh, fields in the same distributory scheme, uh, but it requires further diagnostic analysis to understand the factors behind spatial and temporal variations, which will allow us to plan further interventions and optimizing the performance of the system. So to conclude this short lecture, um, I would like to point out monitoring is important to identify gaps and interventions, to plan the allocation of resources, and remote sensing um, is developing much faster now. Um, and it is recognized as a very good alternative uh, to develop a monitoring system uh, to offer continuous monitoring at high spatial and temporal scale. As I pointed out, the main advantage is uh, the different scales at which we can uh, offer this analysis. Um, of course, it requires more diagnostic analysis on the factors behind water productivity variation uh, to get insights into practices and interventions. Um, two major limitations are the validation of estimates are still challenging. Of course, there are a lot of studies going on to, uh, to validate and calibrate the remote sensing based estimates. Uh, and with the optical satellite data, cloud cover is a major challenge in many, many parts of the world. Um, and the complexity in fine tuning the models like Sabal uh, regionally. So that also is a challenge in extending uh, models like Sabal to other parts of the world. With this, I want to conclude uh, this short lecture. Thank you for listening.